You are listening to Open Democracy. Hello and welcome to the Open Democracy Show. I'm James. Last week, on the anniversary of Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, we held a live discussion where our Ukrainian journalists could share their experiences of the war. What you're about to hear is a condensed version of that discussion, but if you'd like to watch the whole thing, head over to our YouTube channel and under the Live tab, you'll be able to listen to the full recording. My name is Daniel Trilling. I'm an editor at Open Democracy and I work across various bits of the site. But one thing I've been doing a lot of work on over the past year is working with some of our contributors from Ukraine and other uh, post-Soviet states, particularly on coverage responding to the full-scale invasion that was launched a year ago this week. We've got three really, really valuable and I hope fascinating panellists to um, talk to you today. Joining us, first of all, we have Igor Berdiga, who is a regular contributor to Open Democracy. He's reported widely on the 2014 uh, Euromaidan revolution, Russia's annexation of Crimea, the military conflict in eastern Ukraine, and the 2022 Russian invasion. Uh, joining Igor is Katerina Semchuk. Uh, Katerina is Ukraine correspondent at Open Democracy, where she covers the human and socio-economic impacts of Russia's invasion. And she's been doing that in a very concerted way for us over the past year and digging out stories that I think are really outstanding among what is now a very crowded field of um, journalism being done on Ukraine. And then last but not least, we're delighted to have joining us Oliver Bullo, who is a journalist now based in the UK, but has worked extensively in Ukraine and Russia. He's author most recently of Butler to the World, How Britain Became the Servant of Tycoons, Tax Dodgers, Kleptocrats and Criminals. And just before that, the book Moneyland, Why Thieves and Crooks Now Rule the World and How to Take It Back. So just before I hand over to the panellists, I just wanted to say a few words about um, open democracy and the kind of work we've been trying to do on Ukraine, uh, particularly over the past year. Um, And one of the things that I think has been particularly strong about open democracy's coverage is that we've been able to draw on the knowledge and expertise of journalists who live in Ukraine, who understand that country um, in a way that many correspondents who are brought in from the outside perhaps don't. I'm really glad we've got both Katia and Igor to talk about their work here. I think before I hand over to the panellists, I'd just say one more thing, which is to thank anybody over the past year who has supported Open Democracy's work on Ukraine and on other related subjects. We're, We're really glad that people have first of all, read what we're publishing, that they've shared it with other people, uh, and also grateful to people who've donated to support our work, because we are funded partly by reader contributions, and and we can't do it without that kind of support. I would also just say, just as as a tip more than anything, do please sign up for our regular ODR newsletter, because that's the best way to stay updated on the stories that we're producing from Ukraine and from the wider region. What I'd like to do now is to first turn to uh, Katia. Perhaps for readers who are less familiar with your work so far, um, what particular aspects of uh, the war and of Ukrainian life more generally have you have you chosen to report on? And what is it about those topics that you think is um, so important to be telling readers um, around the world about? Um, as we know, Ukraine is covered by a lot of people and journalists at the moment. And I would say a lot of issues that include something that is happening inside Ukraine, not on the battlefield and not on the uh, international scene. This is something uh, that I'm interested to cover and also, uh, fortunately, that uh, Open Democracy are also interested to cover. Some of the reforms prior to Russia's invasion are now becoming also visible and also in the need of coverage because because of the lack of uh, coverage of the international media. I think my interest is in maybe giving also different kind of image of Ukraine and only the one that is always uh, linked to war zones, conflicts, problems and suffering and and violence. Uh, So yes, I think the war creates some of the issues that are not on the front line of uh, Ukrainians' concern, like survival and trying to back Russia, but I still pose the question of uh, equal rights and um, equal treatment and something that maybe government doesn't have resources to deal with or there is no system put into the place. One such issue is the uh, issue of um, prisoners of war, Ukrainian prisoners of war in Russian custody, relatives of those who had been captured by Russian military and placed sometimes in prisons or different camps. Uh, have difficulty in communicating with the government and institutions that are responsible for returning those prisoners 
and uh, they were frustrated at the lack of cooperation with their relatives or a uh, problem influencing any decision making or um, they felt sometimes how if they will be silent for a moment that Ukraine will probably forget or leave the issue to resolve itself. And I think the biggest issue I stems upon writing this is that the government wasn't also cooperative in responding to journalist requests. Uh, it was difficult to get any response from the Ministry of Defense on this issue because they that much uh, try to avoid uh, communicating anything about uh, prisoners so, so that the exchange wouldn't fall through because there are lo lots of different uh, stakes uh, on Russian side and Ukrainian side. It's a complex process. Um, so that's also like a, a journalist's responsibility to um, understand and to take that into account. Thank you very much for that, Katia. And I think that to do your job as a journalist, you have to ask difficult questions. You know, even, even institutions that you might be broadly supportive of as a journalist, sometimes you find out stuff that, that doesn't put them in the best possible light. And that's a fundamental part of independent journalism is, is the ability and freedom to do that. And I think, as I know you've written about, being able to do that journalism independently is not in conflict with uh, the sort of the priorities of Ukrainian society at the moment, but it's actually a really, really essential part of it. I think this is a nice moment actually to move on to Igor. Igor, I know, has done a lot of reporting for Open Democracy and elsewhere, uh, particularly on the city of Kherson, which is in southern Ukraine and is somewhere that was occupied by Russian forces early last year at the beginning of the invasion, but has since been deoccupied. The military situation has changed quite drastically and sometimes at very short notice, and journalists have had to work out how to uh, keep up with developments there. So Igor, I wondered if you could just tell us a little bit about maybe like your priorities as a reporter over the past year, like what it's been important for you to focus on, and then a bit more about the situation as it's been developing more recently um, in Kherson itself. When you're working as a journalist in Ukraine in like 15 years like me, uh, you're changing topics like every two or three years. I started from mobile technology and IT journalism, then to uh, agriculture business, then to revolution, then to war, then to human rights, etc., etc. As far as I remember, in April last year, we just started to discuss what topics should I cover, and that and that was like a maybe a little bit stupid proposal to cover the stories from my native city because I never did it before. It was like I leave the city behind, uh, but the situation was really dramatic, and it was very personal at that moment. So we decided that uh, to cover Kherson and to cover the voice as a person is the really like a gentle mission. And it was completely interesting because it was the time of like a two or three power in the city, the Russian occupation administration, uh, the local governments, uh, some of resistant movements and a lot of uh, citizens who just want to escape the city that they called that's a new Russian city, and now they are shelling them just yesterday. It was the very, <laughs> very scary situation where they, after the shelling, uh, five persons, five people dies on the, just on the bus. Uh, and it's new reality for the, for the Kherson people, for the people of Kherson, for the cities, for, for the, those citizens who live in, in the city, they are living it in new reality when it's the frontline city. But it's like more dangerous and more scary situation like the Russian was in the city. Because when the Russian was in the city, Ukrainian forces uh, didn't uh, attack uh, uh, the Kherson by rockets, by artillery, by missiles, etc. When your target is to keep the independent view on the things in Ukraine, uh, you face it. Now you should face the the huge problem because uh, what I see now is the real dichotomy for Ukrainian journalists is to write for Ukrainian audience and be not so dramatic and not so pessimistic about this war. At the same time, when you write into the Western audience, you should ask, you should always remind for help. And it's a little bit difficult because when you're trying to keep uh, yourself as an independent Ukrainian journalist, you should keep in mind the Ukrainian independence. I mean, independence of Ukraine and the independence of people of Ukraine, probably, first of all. I think you've hit on another really important point for this discussion, which is the journalists are very often under these 
sometimes conflicting pressures. And you're trying to link those local stories up with national and international concerns and find the connections between them. And um, I actually thought that that's a good point at which to just um, uh, turn to Oliver. You have, um, you know, you've, you've worked extensively as a, a reporter and journalist in uh, Ukraine and Russia. You've been based in a region at points in your career, but you are now uh, based in the UK, as far as I know. Um, and a lot of your recent journalism has been on the face of it more UK focus, but obviously there are big kind of international connections between those two areas of your work. And I just wondered if you would mind just telling us in the course of your reporting over the years, if you tried to connect up what you've seen in Ukraine or the way it relates to Russia with some of the things you've investigated and reported on in, in the UK and elsewhere in the world. I used to live in, in Moscow. I've worked um, in Kiev and, and elsewhere and in Eastern Europe very um, widely for many years. And it became increasingly clear to me that I couldn't understand that part of the world without writing about corruption, because so much of what was the problem that was afflicting uh, Ukraine or Russia or Kyrgyzstan or wherever was was caused by corruption. And you don't have to research corruption for very long to realise that corruption isn't a Ukrainian problem. It's a problem caused at least as much by Britain as it is caused by Ukraine. The money ends up in Britain the money flows through multiple British-owned tax havens. And therefore, we are at least as much um, a cause of that problem as the Ukrainian politicians who steal the money in the first place. Uh, so much of what went wrong in, in eastern Ukraine and in Crimea was caused by the fact that so many of the local officials were corrupt and could just be bought off by Russia back in 2014. And I'm sure the same is happening now. Just earlier this week, we held a kleptocracy tour in uh, London. It's something we do to highlight uh, the, the luxurious properties that are owned by oligarchs in London. Um, and on our tour is always uh, the tube station and mansion belonging to Dmitro Firtash, uh, a Ukrainian um, oligarch who did very well trading Russian gas with Ukraine and with uh, Western Europe, made a very large fortune and invested that fortune primarily in the UK, uh, including in 2014 buying a disused tube station from the British government. I don't think there is any story that more dramatically underscores the um, complacency, uh, to put it mildly, of the British government when it comes to money that has been extracted from Ukraine by oligarchs and is being spent overseas. I mean, there have been changes to what Britain has been doing since the full-scale war began in, in February last year, but not nearly enough. Um, and um, there is signs of sadly waning interest, particularly in this campaign to get dirty money out of our economies and to prevent oligarchs being able to launder and keep their money. So, you know, the, this this sadly is very much not over. Yeah, um, thank you very much, Oliver. I think that's really useful context. And I think just like Katia and Igor have said already, it reinforces the fact that this is an ongoing story. You know, these things have not stopped. They've not ground to a halt because the war has sort of pushed them all out of the way. And I think journalistically, it's just as important to keep drawing those connections, even when that maybe is inconvenient for politicians who want us to keep quiet about it, because a war is a great time for politicians to say there are more important things to worry about than uh, this or that that you're raising. So picking up on that idea of how things are still developing, I just wanted to come back to um, Katia first and then Ihor and actually ask you both the same question. Do you feel like you've learned new things about Ukrainian society over the past year that perhaps you weren't aware of uh, beforehand? This conflict expanded not over the last year, but since 2014 and up until the very last moment, not everybody in Ukraine would feel that um, Ukrainians would respond to Russia's full scale invasion that unanimously. The resistance and ability to adapt to the new challenges that Russia poses in terms of uh, its war and strategies every time amazes me. I think it's also something that I am trying to illustrate how people understand the threat that they are standing against and how they find. But also, despite the war, Ukrainians still care about the country that we, they live in. Um, they care about the same issues that they cared through last year. It's uh, their salary, their security, their social 
uh, benefits. I wonder, Ihor, is that something that, that you've noticed in the course of your reporting? It's a chance because, you know, I spent like a couple of months uh, to talk with the, a lot of colleagues of mine, the journalists and the politicians, and to explain that the south of Ukraine, the Kherson region, uh, is not for Russian region, was not for Russian region, as the, a lot of people saw they are fighting for freedom. Uh, the ability and the brave to fight uh, against invasion is the same that you saw from 2014. The Russian-speaking citizen fighting against Russia occupation, the same. The point that not surprised me, but that inspires me much more than even in 2014, is the ability and, and, and winning the people of Ukraine to, to protect the freedom. That's the kind of abstract freedom, probably. That's even not democracy in the Western understanding. That's even not fighting against corruption. Because for me, as a Ukrainian journalist, as a person who looks at Ukrainian society during the 15 years, the people of Ukraine, they are not very fair. They're a bit corrupted. They, they do corruption, but they don't love them, but they do corruption. Yeah, they, they want to judge another person, not themselves, even inside the society. They don't want paying taxes. They don't want to vote on the election. So they, they believe that all of the politicians are liars. A lot of controversial things was inside the Ukrainian society, but no one except the people of Ukraine can tell the people of Ukraine how to do. This war continues, continues because the people of Ukraine want this, because the people of Ukraine want, want to fight for freedom. And no one outside this country can tell maybe for Ukrainian people what this freedom is completely. What you've lighted on there is, in a way, the invasion over the past year has forced people in lots of different places to kind of confront the fact they didn't really understand Ukraine. You know, there were U Ukrainians, perhaps, as you were saying, misunderstood one another there are sort of these really fundamental aspects of Ukrainian society that, that were not very well understood a year ago or before, you know, the relationship between Eastern and Western Ukraine or the Russian speaking areas and Ukrainian speaking areas and so on. Certainly, you know, from, from what I've learned from your journalism, Ihor, and your journalism, Katia, and of co colleagues we've published at Open Democracy, is just how important it is to understand nuances of a society if you want to understand why people behave the way they do or why a war unfolds the way it does and so on. I just wanted to ask you, Oliver, one final question. What kind of journalism would you like to see being done now on on Ukraine and the issues surrounding it? Are there things that at the moment aren't being covered or that correspondents from, from outside of Ukraine could be doing better? I think part of the problem has been that for many years, in fact, for always, uh, Ukraine has tended to be covered um, by Western media outlets out of Moscow. A lot of Western journalism, and this is something that the Russians would probably disagree with, but I, I think this is true. A lot of Western journalism was very much seeing Ukraine through Russian eyes, simply because that was, you know, when we thought we understood it, we actually understood what Russians were saying about it. We tend to understand Ukraine as an extension of Russia, simply because that tends to be where people come to it from. You know, I think this there's no easy answer to this. It requires, you know, embedding journalists in Kiev, in other cities in Ukraine, as so many have been now, but for the long term. Uh, so we can really understand it as a as a as a separate civilization, as a separate country with its own, you know, language and tradition and history. Because you know, it is it is too easy uh, to to listen to the loudest person, and the loudest person uh, in the former Soviet Union it, it is Russia. So you know, I think it was Leonid Kuchma's autobiography um, was titled "Ukraine is not Russia." Um, the fact that the the president of the country felt the need to make that point in on the front cover of his autobiography, you know, expresses pretty clearly the fact that that is something that has rankled for a long time and with good reason. Just if if I may add my own thought in addition to that, I think it it's very important to have um, journalists who can draw these connections across borders, and I think that's something that Open Democracy does really well in terms of its work following the money, for instance. Um, you know, investigate stories here in the UK. That, that expose those kind of links that Oliver was talking about earlier, the fact that the UK is this, this crucial clearinghouse for, for stolen money from, from both Ukraine and Russia and how that's actually something that our own government and previous governments have been complicit in facilitating. 
Well, coming back to uh, who tells the story uh, about what, and I think asking uh, Ukrainian journalists to to write the stories, not some some journalists who just you know, end up in Ukraine without prior knowledge of the language or knowledge of the region or was just covering war zone somewhere else, like, like understanding the reporting would be different uh, in those circumstances is uh, essentially. It's really important, uh, Katya. Thanks for that. And I think that's a, ve- that's a very good um, point for us to conclude on today. Um, just thank all of my colleagues on the team who, you know, write, edit, promote um, the reporting that Katya, Igor and other colleagues have been doing on these and many other issues. Um, I'd like to thank Igor, Katia and Oliver for their really interesting contributions to the discussion today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for listening. Again, we'd just like to extend our thanks to Oliver Below for joining us and obviously to Igor and Katia for their continued work bringing us stories from within Ukraine. Just to reinforce what Daniel said earlier, I'd also highly recommend subscribing to the ODR newsletter. You can do that over opendemocracy.net. And as well as following Open Democracy on social media, you can also follow ODR specifically. So why not head over to your social media platform of choice and give them a follow as well. If you enjoyed today's episode and you're not yet subscribed to the podcast, then please consider giving us a subscribe. And if you're listening on an Apple device, leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts really helps us extend our reach. Thank you so much for listening and I hope you have a great day. You've been listening to a podcast supported by Open Democracy. If you liked it, please consider making a small donation to help us do more. As a small media organisation, Open Democracy relies on the backing of people like you to keep going. Go to opendemocracy.net now to support our work. And one more thing, to avoid missing out on future episodes, don't forget to subscribe to this show in your favourite podcast app.